Let's take a look at an example from our reading, uh, Robert Hunter's article on building turnpikes in early Virginia. This article provides good insight into the work of engineers, the work of the engineer in the early 19th century, into the role of the engineers, in, including the limitations on that role, the role of, of the lone ranger engineer. He very nicely lays out some of the frustrations that engineers experience by virtue of their, their role as gentlemen managers uh, who lived in, worked in positions of uh, advise, uh, giving advice or advisory roles. Put yourself in the early 19th century, um, before the Civil War, antebellum, let's say, Virginia or elsewhere. We, let's picture the country the, in the countryside as a set of small towns, mostly farmers and various tradesmen and the like. Um, farmers having difficulty getting their goods to market. They come up with an idea to build a, build a road. How would they go about building a road? Here we might say um, where Virginia Tech is located, Blacksburg, a small town of Blacksburg. Let's say the farmers get together. In fact, all of you, you are now um, uh, members of the town of Blacksburg, and I'm inviting you to attend a Blacksburg town meeting here in the 1830s or 1840s. Let's build a road from Blacksburg to a, a local town, town nearby called Christiansburg. How are we going to go about building a road? Well, let's call a meeting. Get everybody together. Um, we'll all meet in the town hall and, uh, and decide how we're going to go about building this road. So what do you think we should do? What do we need? Well, we need money. Where are we going to get the money? When I ask this question in class, people regularly say, well, you get the money from the state. Well, kind of. But remember, we live in a country that's very skeptical of centralized government. We want to keep our, our governments relatively weak. And it was sometimes said in the 19th century that government served primarily as a policeman and a judge. And that was it. So we can't just appeal to the king and say the king is responsible for building our roads. Somehow we have to do it. What about the expertise? Well, you say get a contractor, right? Well. Where do we find a contractor? How do we pay a contractor? How, do you, how does a road provide income? Well, you say tolls. Tolls will, pro will provide, uh, provide the means for paying a contractor. But wait, you don't collect tolls until you've completed the road. And the contractor needs money. <clears throat> also, tolls provide a rather slow return on one's investment similar to the electric utility industry that we have discussed. So we have a problem of needing a large capital investment with a relatively small but permanent rate of return. Well, we don't have it here in this group at our town meeting. I don't see anyone out there that seems to have a whole lot of money. We're going to go to the state. But how do we go to the state? What's our connection here in our locality, from our locality, to our state? Well, there's one person. We have a representative. Let's call this representative Jim Schuler. Jim Schuler is currently the state uh, uh, representative, representative to the General Assembly from our town, from our local area. Well, we take this guy, Jim Schuler, and we send him off. And we tell him to go negotiate with his colleagues and say, I want to build a road from Blacksburg to Christiansburg. Well, there's no clear structure for the state legislature to say, OK, go build a road. And indeed, when he goes to the state legislature and goes to the General Assembly, other people want to build roads in other places. How does this end up happening? In 1817, the, uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia passed a, a law called the, Gen uh, the General Turnpike Law that um, created and guided uh, a new institution called the Board of Public Works and, and provided a set of rules for them to use in dealing with private turnpike companies. 
Notice, we have a state law setting up a Board of Public Works to deal with private turnpike companies. We have both government and we have industry. The American innovation, the American approach to, to civil engineering projects is what Hunter describes as a mixed enterprise system. It ends up being a combination of government in the French tradition and private industry in the British tradition. So, now it's, we're past 1817, how do we build this road given a Board of Public Works and given, a con given the concept of private turnpike companies? Well, since we don't have enough money to build a road and we want to get some money from the state, we do have to send Jim Schuler off and he has to negotiate with his buddies in the state legislature. And it's his job to strike deals. It's his job to make compromises. It's his job to figure out how to get authorization for a road for our region, and probably in exchange for voting for roads or something else in some other regions. If Jim Schuler is successful, the General Assembly issues charters of incorporation. The General Assembly charters a company. We've got to form a company. So all you people in the room here, you've got to participate uh, participate in this company, or at least those of you who are going to give money. Perhaps it's only those of us who have money who are going to form this company. Indeed, it's probably a small set of us, a small set of the, of the local leaders, the, uh, the people with land, um, the landed gentry in a way in the United States, in the United States context. So a small set of people form a company. Let's call it the uh, Blacksburg Christiansburg Road Company. We form a company, we have a little bit of money to invest in it, but not enough. Well, Jim Schuler has now, has now gotten state approval, a state charter for the Blacksburg Christiansburg Road Company, and it has now been formally incorporated by the Commonwealth of Virginia. The, the State Assembly, the General Assembly, directs the Board of Public Works to provide support for this company of ours. And what that means for us is that, this, um, that our company gets to sell some of its stock to the state. Indeed, we're allowed to sell up to 40% of the stock, of our stock, to the state. <coughs> we, so what that means for us as, as, as developers, what that means for us as investors, is that in order to develop a road company or establish a road company and get a road built, we need to come up with 60% of the total, which is a great deal because once the tolls start coming in, we pay back the state at little or no interest, and then we effectively get the entire return on, on, our inv on the 100% on the, uh, of the investment, given a 60% uh, contribution. Now, when the company gets established, and we're able to raise the other 60%, and we get the 40% from the state in the form of selling stock, the company gets uh, has to establish an organization. Um, the, an organization that will consist of, of, a, of agents, managers, superintendents, um, people who would somehow directly uh, participate in the organization of the project and it's in carrying out the project, but not engineers. Now, engineers won't participate or, or generally didn't, um, aren't part of the corporate or the, um, the company's management structure because of the proprietary interests. Engineers are supposed to be working for the public as a whole and not, in the, um, not maximizing the self-interest of the new incorporated, newly incorporated company. Well, what about technical expertise for this project? Who gives advice? The, the way Virginia decided to handle this was a uniquely French, through a uniquely French innovation by establishing a, a state-level job called the Principal Engineer of Virginia. The first Principal Engineer of Virginia was Claudius Crozet. He was a permanent employee of the state, but he worked and lived in a somewhat of funny role for him as a Frenchman. Born in France, in 1789, Crozet was trained under, Nap under Napoleon at the Ecole Polytechnique, which was the distinct distinguished engineering school established by Napoleon. But after the Napoleon's fall, after the fall of Nap Napoleon, Crozet was viewed with suspicion 
and had trouble uh, retaining a position in the government. For him, the solution was to come to the United States. In the United States, he went to work at West Point, the school most like his own training, where he introduced the French tradition of theory, especially Monge's descriptive geometry. To the extent today you, uh, we learn engineering drafting or drawing, to the extent we emphasize 3D visualization, we're drawing upon this tradition of Monge's descriptive geometry introduced in the United States by Crozet. Crozet is also known, by the way, as the founder of the Virginia Military Institute, VMI, which is built very much on the model of the École Polytechnique. After working at West Point, he went on to work for the state of Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia, as the principal, uh, um, as the principal engineer of Virginia. For a Frenchman, this job was somewhat or seemed somewhat appropriate because he's working now directly for the government, the role, the, the position that he valued most, but it was a relatively unsatisfactory position for a Frenchman because he didn't carry the authority that he would have had in France. And his, his story and this experience here illustrates, again, the ways in which in the United States the civil engineer lived as a relatively autonomous professional as somewhat of a lone ranger, even when he was uh, uh, working officially as an employee of the state. 